I might introduce to, um, <clears throat> to welcome to today's talk, Just One Piece of the Puzzle, Connecting Your Family History, with State Library and Archive Service staff members Chloe House and Amber Lee Darlington Beresford. During this talk, Chloe and Amber Lee will share their experiences writing blogs for the Duck Trousers, Straw Bonnets and Bluey Exhibition. Stories of fabric and clothing in Tasmania now showing here. <laughs> the blogs were written to complement the story walls of the exhibition to explore some of the fascinating and unknown stories of Tasmanian history of manufacturing clothing and fabric in greater de depth. Today's talk is being broadcasted as a webinar and we are pleased to welcome those people who are going to join us online today. In due, due course, the talk will be available on Library Tasmania's SoundCloud and on Library Tasmania's YouTube channel. If you haven't already done so, can you please switch your phones off? <laughs> Chloe and Amberley will take questions at the end of their talk. Before I introduce Chloe and Amberley, I'd like to read to you Library Tasmania's acknowledgement of Tasmanians Aboriginal peoples. Library Tasmania recognises the deep histories and cultures of the Aboriginal people of Lituaita, Tasmania. We acknowledge Tasmanian Aboriginal people as the traditional and continuing custodians of the land, waters and sky. We pay respect to the elders past and present who hold the memories, traditions, culture and knowledge of country. We extend our respect to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples whose countries were never ceded. Please join me in welcoming Chloe and Amber Lee. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, we would like to begin by thanking you for joining us today, either in person or virtually, uh, as we talk about researching family history and our experiences writing blogs for the duck trousers, straw bonnets and bluey exhibition. Throughout this talk, we wish to share with you the knowledge that we have gained through the form of a friendly guide with tips, tricks and examples aimed to assist you with writing your family history. Tasmania has a long history of manufacturing fabric, textiles and clothing, and there are many stories to be told, even more than what can be seen on the exhibition walls around us. Our blogs intended to expand upon just two of these stories, a tale of two woolen mills and a very serious want of clothing. A Tale of Two Woolen Wheels takes us back to the origin of Tasmania's woolen industry in the late 1860s and 70s. It explores the connection between local businesses located in both the north and the south of Tasmania and the incentive of £1,000 that was offered by the local government in 1869. The blogs, the blogs that complement this part of our exhibition are a three-part series titled The Race to a Thousand Pounds. Within these blogs, we explore the pivotal moments of history through key eyes of key characters and individuals. It provides further insight into how the woolen industry of Tasmania developed, the relationships between the individuals and the connections with their communities. A very serious want of clothing showcases the clothing issued and made by convicts on their journey to and upon their arrival in Van Diemen's land. It tells a story of men and boys sewing garments aboard the Peston G. Bowman G. convict transport ship in 1845 and the manufacturing tasks assigned to male and female convicts in factories and penal stations while serving their sentences. The story I chose to tell corresponds to the section of the wall dedicated to the Anson, a convict transport ship turned female probation station. The blog titled Manufacturing Reform, Female Convicts and Straw Bonnets chronicles the development of various manufacturing endeavours aboard the Anson, most notably that of straw bonnets and the female superintendent at the helm of this venture, with the vision of reforming the women on board. During the process of researching, interpreting information and writing our blogs, we discovered that family history is made up of several small pieces that contribute together to make a broader picture, much like the pieces of a jigsaw puzzle. We hope that this talk will give you some insight into how to treat the pieces of your puzzle as you discover, research and write your own stories. So where do we begin when we venture down the path of researching and writing family history? 
we suggest starting with finding your story. Every story starts with an idea. When it comes to writing and sharing tales of our past, there are endless possibilities. And sometimes it can be a bit difficult of knowing where to start. Whether you want to tell the story of your own family history, your hometown, a local business, an industry, or perhaps someone who inspires you, the first step is in-depth and thorough research. This will enable you to turn your idea into a story. When curating the Duck Trousers, Straw Bonnets and Bluey exhibition, our team's collective aim was to feature the history of fabric and clothing manufacturing in Tasmania. A broad topic such as this offered endless possibilities when it came to brainstorming and researching the subtopics that existed within it. Under the leadership of archivist Dr Ali Marchant, our team gathered as much relevant information as possible from, re from the range of sources available to us in the State Library and Archives. Our approach to this task was to start broad and gradually narrow down each topic to reveal the individual stories within. Initially, our team identified five key research topics, including wool, leather and tanneries, boots and shoemaking, convict clothing, and the iconic retailers and fashion houses. Once we identified these topics, we individually gathered more information, researching for images, articles, first-hand accounts, and other records that offered insight into the people, places, and events relevant to each topic. In addition to the records found within the Tasmanian archives, the Tasmanian Names Index, Guides to Records, and Trove were crucial in this stage of our research journey. Each team member took note of their initial findings to bring to exhibition meetings and to revisit down the track. When you're commencing your research journey, the amount of information or records that you locate can grow rapidly. You will want to find an efficient way of storing all of your information. While there are no standards on how you can do this, um, <laughs> when you undertake this step, it's crucial that you find a way that is best for you. For example, you could gather and store information in a Word document with a timeline and dot points. It could be a folder with a USB for a different section on each person, time or place. Others may opt for a website such as ancestry.com or find my family. Or maybe you'll be a bit like us and have a pile of seemingly disorganized chaos scattered across your desk. Whatever your process is, we suggest being consistent in your approach. In addition to this, we strongly recommend taking note of where your source material originated and record your references as you go. Whether your source is a published book or an archival item, make note of the title, publication date, archival number and author. If you aren't familiar with referencing archival materials, you can access Libraries Tasmania's Guide to Citing Our Resources. While this step may not seem important at the stage of finding your story, it will help you locate the information in the future. After all, there is nothing worse than remembering a quote or image from a primary or secondary source and not being able to find it when you need it most. After compiling a substantial amount of information and taking note of where these records could be found, each member of the exhibition team took up a focus area of research. We refined our ideas looking for the who, what, when, where and how of our stories, as well as following any other leads that surfaced during the early stages of our research. It was at this stage that the individual stories of the exhibition came to life, begging to be told. When it came to finding the story I wanted to tell, I did not have the intention of writing it as a blog. Rather, my approach was to find a topic that would support the exhibition and could be included on one of the story walls. In saying that, as I conducted my research, I also wrote short excerpts or paragraphs analysing the information I had found in the hope that it may be helpful later. I started my research with the broad topic of convicts in Van Diemen's land. On the one hand, I wanted to explore the connections between major events or periods in the state's history and the clothing worn by those at that time. And on the other hand, I was intrigued by the convict era because it is a time we know so much about as a result of the records held here at the State Library and Archives, as well as the heritage listed locations around the state that mem memorialise this time in our history. Des but despite all this knowledge, there remains aspects of this time that are untold or unknown. I conducted my initial research using the Companion to Tasmanian History compiled online by Alison Alexander. 
This resource offers a wide range of articles written by researchers and historians on topics related to Tasmanian history. With the broad topic for my blog established, I began with the article dedicated to convicts. This provided the context required to begin narrowing down my ideas and refresh my own memory and understanding of the convict era in Van Diemen's land. During this phase of my research, I sought to find mentions of clothing or other relevant keywords or phrases. What I found, however, was very little mention of female convicts and rather a lot of information on the experiences of male convicts. As someone with a passion for identifying and telling the stories of forgotten women throughout history, this lack of recognition for female convicts piqued my interest. This triggered a new line of thought. Rather than asking what convicts wore as a whole group, I considered what type of clothing female convicts wore and what type of tasks they had to complete in that clothing. As this would suggest, when looking for frequent or recurring words and phrases, also take note of what is not mentioned. Think about the people who may be left out of a story because they were not the majority or the main characters, because they will likely have a story to be told. Having established the scope of my research topic, I continued looking specifically for resources related to female convicts and female factories, looking to gather information on their specific experiences and how clothing factored into their lives. The HMS Anson or Anson Probation Station was a topic that popped up regularly in the sources I found. And a turning point in my research came about when I found a page on the Female Convicts Research Centre website entitled Convict Clothing. The webpage detailed the pieces of clothing worn by women at different points of their lives as convicts and again mentioned the Anson and the specific clothing worn by female convicts on board. This linked to another webpage dedicated solely to the Anson. Here I found more information about its role as a probation station where female convicts would be sent for six months upon their arrival in Hobart Town. Here I came across quotations from historical newspaper articles referring to the manufacture of shoes, straw bonnets, straw hats and doormats and the undertaking of wool production as a form of employment, all of which was completed on board the ship at Prince of Wales Bay. Amber Lee and I will speak about the development of your story from an idea in greater depth soon. But for now, I will note that if something sparks your curiosity while researching, don't ignore it. While it may not fall into your initial plan or intentions, it may offer greater possibilities. When our team set out to develop the stories within this exhibition space, I randomly picked the theme of wool to investigate. I took to the historic newspaper collection and began searching through trove using keywords such as wool, woolen, sheep, woven, the list could go on. During this initial search, I stumbled across an article that was published in the Examiner on the 21st of July, 1874. It spoke of the birth of a local industry, the lure of a thousand pound bonus offered by the Tasmanian government, conflicting opinions, misinterpretations and rivalry across both the North and South of Tasmania. I thought to myself, with all this drama and subtle red flags, this was a story that needed to be told. But where to start? Who were the main characters? Where did it all begin? Did someone ever claim the thousand pounds? These questions, along with several others, flooded my mind awaiting to be answered. And so I took a deep dive into more research. I started to look for keywords in every article. Amongst these words were government incentive, Waverley woolen mills, Hobart Town woolen manufacturers, as well as many others listed on the screen before you. The more I researched, the more frequently these words would appear. Through this process, I eventually uncovered the main characters in this tale. In the north stood a private enterprise consisting of Scotsman Peter Bullman and the Johnston brothers, and to the south was a local businessman named Joseph James Overall and a factory manager named David Gledhill. Once I had located the foundations of my story and identified all of the main characters, I could start to be a bit more specific with my research. Using a combination of trove, the Tasmanian Names Index and the Tasmanian Archives, I refined my search looking for key events or records that directly related to the individuals within my story. 
The information you collect during the foundations of your research become the primary puzzle pieces of your story. You may choose to highlight many sources of information in your storytelling or focus on just one. Nevertheless, the process of research and finding those pieces of the puzzle can be time consuming. Just like a jigsaw puzzle, depending on its size or level of complexity, the process of putting it all together can take time. There can be missing pieces where fragments might be hard to interpret or be slightly damaged, or perhaps you don't even know what the end picture should look like. While this can be an unnerving prospect, it is all part of finding the story you want to tell. Like any puzzle, start with just one piece. As this discussion suggests, when it comes to family history, that piece could be a person, time or place. Once you have put down the first piece, you can develop your ideas and story from there. Information manifests in several ways when researching the past. You may find relevant information in local, state and national newspapers, government records, births, deaths and marriages, convict records, wills or funeral notices, church registers and baptismal records, to name just a few. While these information sources may not provide lengthy descriptive sentences, they can be interpreted and analysed to reveal much more than first thought. There are many ways to interpret information. It can be read, analysed, transcribed, criticised or completely discarded. Both Chloe and I use different approaches when determining what information would constructively add to our stories and our puzzles. From an analytical point of view, I used a range of sources combining primary and secondary resources to understand the full range of opinions, thoughts and records on the topic of the Anson and especially Mrs Bowden in her role as matron and later as sole superintendent of the probation station. When it comes to historical research, primary and secondary sources are generally distinguishable by the time in which they were created. Put simply, a primary source is created at a particular point in time, while a secondary source is created after that time. As Gotts Chalk states, a primary source is the testimony of an eyewitness, and a secondary source is the testimony of anyone who is not an eyewitness. Writing history from a critical point of view requires engagement with both forms of information. This ensures in-depth and balanced outcomes. The main source of primary information for my blog was Trove. This resource of primary source newspaper articles not only revealed contemporary opinions on the Anson and Mrs Bowden by journalists, newspaper editors and onlookers, but I found that Mrs Bowden had published responses to her critics and her supporters in those newspapers also. The advanced search option on Trove, in which you can narrow the search fields using filters based on location, date range, record type or keywords, was the best place to start. I utilised the information I had previously gathered and identified keywords such as HMS Anson, Anson, Mrs Bowden, Anson Probation Station and female convicts. I conducted searches for each term and I can occasionally combined two or three to narrow the results further. I used a date range a few years before the Anson was implemented in 1844 and a few years after it stopped operation in 1849 in the hope that there would there may be information published in hindsight. I also refined the location to Tasmania. Trove is a wonderful resource as it allows you to narrow and broaden your search parameters as needed. When using Trove, if you are not getting results, adjust your search terms. Go broader, use synonyms, alternative spelling or other common words. The least helpful thing you could do is conduct a single search and accept nothing. Continue searching until you find something or until you are content that you have tried every possible search option before moving on to another search tool such as the Tasmanian Names Index or Tasmanian Archives Catalogue. It's also worth noting that although these newspapers provided a great deal of insight and formed the basis of my story, there remained a need to separate fact from fiction. When utilising information from the past, you may come across contemporary biases that may exist in primary sources or misinformation that has been passed down word of mouth through generations. While primary sources are generally considered authoritative artefacts from the past, in the case of Mrs Bowden, I was faced with biased accounts on the grounds of her gender and her running of the Anson. 
As I will reveal later, while you may choose to discard these resources, they can also be used to your advantage when it comes to writing your story. While I found an immense amount of information on Mrs Bowden in newspapers contemporary to the convict era, there is scarcely much recorded of her, effort, her and her efforts in secondary resources. I utilise secondary resources, such as those shown on the screen, that contribute to the small field of research on the topic of the Anson or Mrs Bowden's running of it. Despite this, there is missing or insufficient information, and thus I could not have written the story this story based solely on this secondary research. It is here where I will emphasise to you the importance of embracing the gaps that arise in existing literature. These missing pieces in someone else's story can become the main characters in yours. And that was what I intended to do with my blog. While records can tell us the quick facts of the who, what, why, or when, they can also give us an insight into what motivates an individual and what they value. From my background in performance, I value the importance of portraying authentic characters. It is my belief that in doing so, we allow others to perceive our characters as ordinary, everyday people. As writers and storytellers, we want our audience to emphasise and connect with these characters so that they're more than just a name on a piece of paper. Whilst the practice of characterisation is more commonly embraced in fiction and creative writing, we can still apply the same processes when we inter interpret and analyse primary and secondary resources whilst maintaining its historical integrity. Whilst using the creative approach of characterisation, I ask myself three questions. Who are the important people in their life? Whether they are their business partner, their family members, friends or social and inner circles? What are the influential events in their life, including births, marriages, social movements, military conflict, environmental and political changes, and how were they portrayed by their community? What were their social footprints? Were they portrayed in a positive or negative life within the newspapers and articles of the time? At first glance, these questions might seem rhetorical. However, by diving deeper when we interpret historical records and articles, we can start to build an impression of who these individuals were what motivated them. Let's expand on this practice by casting a critical eye on the life of Joseph James Overall. Overall was an established draper prior to his pursuit of the woolen industry. In the early 1860s, he entered a partnership with James McMillan and together with Emmanuel Hopkins, they expanded their business with several shops located across Tasmania. One of the locations was Criterion House in Brisbane Street, Launceston. Ultimately, this partnership would dissolve in 1867 after James Macmillan lost his life at sea from drowning. Macmillan had left his assets to another party who were eager to settle outstanding debts and did not wish to support the business plans laid out by overall Macmillan and Hopkins. As you can see by the article displayed on the screen, Overall and Hopkins were forced to sell their wares at a discounted price and downsize their operations. We can imagine that the death of James McMillan would have impacted on the life of Joseph James overall significantly. Whilst I have not located any first-hand correspondence that directly expresses the importance of their relationship, there's a prominent understanding and a strong connection of their friendship between these two individuals. When I was searching for archival material on the Tasmanian Names Index, I located the birth record for Mr Overall's son. Dated 1867, just one year after James Cuff Macmillan drowned at sea, Joseph Overall and his wife Maria named their newborn son James Cuff Macmillan Overall. A name can hold great significance. It can signify a place, memorialise a loved one or a relative, and even hold strong cultural or symbolic meanings. In a time where it was common for some children to remain unnamed on their birth registrations, this conscious decision for Joseph and Maria to name their sons James Cuff Macmillan overall demonstrates the significance of Macmillan's and overall's friendship. When we interpret archival records, it is important to look for more than just the quick facts 
and rather look for details that might hold a deeper meaning. These details can be found by looking deeper into different aspects of an individual's life. This may be exploring a surname, place or location, religion, occupation or any other information that may, may reveal further insights. Going beyond the surface can add context to your story, create further opportunities to expand your research or simply broaden your understanding of the topic, enabling you to write an authentic retelling of the past. A story can be told in several formats. It can be fictional, biographical, imaginative or factual, as complex as Ulysses or as accessible as the stories by Beatrix Potter. There is no right or wrong way to tell a story. When it comes to writing history, however, there is a need to balance authenticity with accessibility and engagement. But how can this be achieved when what, we, what you are telling is based on real people and their life experiences? Family history can be told in many ways. It may be told through transcribed or recorded oral histories, reference genealogies, a biography, memoir or life story, creative nonfiction, edited letters and diaries, or perhaps you will choose to tell the story of your ancestors or hometown as a fictional genealogy based on real people and places. It is up to you to decide how you will tell your story. If you're not sure of where to start, think about the types of stories you enjoy reading. How are they told? Think about who you want to read your story. Do you want it to be used as a form of research for others? Or do you want to target a wider audience with the focus of being accessible to all? My intention from the beginning was to tell a story that was accessible to anyone despite it being grounded in extensive research and analysis. I also felt that the story of a female superintendent aboard a female convict hulk on the Derwent River in and of itself was a fascinating story and that I had the makings of a main character in Mrs Bowden. As such, I opted for a factual and authentic retelling of events without adding creative or fictional flair. I began the writing process by identifying the key aspects of my story, which included the transition of the Anson from a male convict transport ship to a female convict probation station, the introduction of clothing and wool manufacturing on board, and the eventual development of the straw bonnet manufactory at the hands of the women, women on board. These key aspects of the story form the main sections of my blog, alongside an introduction that aim to identify the topic and contextualise the story within the broader timeline of Tasmanian history, and a conclusion which developed, which provided deeper analysis of manufacturing on board the Anson and the role Mrs Bowden played in it. In telling a factual story, I utilised the sources I had found during my research to back up my claims. The use of quotations from primary sources, for instance, enabled me to use Mrs Bowden's own words within my blog. In 1850, following the dissolution of the Anson as a probation station, Mrs Bowden wrote in the Launceston Examiner, until the introduction of straw bonnet making on board, nearly all the poor women were obliged to leave us for going to service without any bonnet. In my analysis of this quote, Mrs Bowden shows compassion for the women in her care and acknowledged their worth beyond the crimes they had committed. In addition to analysing and interpreting primary sources, the use of secondary sources provides greater depth to a discussion and highlights the differing opinions on a topic among researchers and historians. Engaging with existing scholarship allows you to situate your own claims within that historiography. As mentioned in my blog, Kay Daniels argues that Mrs Bowden failed in implementing her plans, while Patrick Howard contends she was the mainspring of penal reform. Acknowledging varying opinions such as these in your writing highlights the complexity of interpreting the past. Different opinions exist to be examined, critiqued and interpreted. And in my case, I use them in addition to my own research to make informed claims about Mrs Bowden and her straw bonnet manufactory. As previously mentioned, rather than discarding biased primary sources, I use them to support my assertion that Mrs Bowden was a formidable woman at a time when women were seen as no more than wives and mothers. 
an article published in 1845 prior to the death of Mrs. Bowden's husband, and thus before she became sole superintendent, wrote, Mrs. Bowden will look with despondency, if not despair, and turning to her husband will say, I really wish we were back in England again. Stop a little, Mrs. B, do not despair. We will take leave to give you a plan by which you will be able to reform these idle, silly creatures, make them usefully industrious, and you effect your, your purpose. They will then become useful servants and complete the reformation by becoming industrious and happy wives and mothers. This source provided context of the broader society Mrs. Bowden and the female convicts on the Anson were a part of. While I could not base my own arguments on this source, it remained relevant in painting a picture of the type of environment Mrs. Bowden faced. As this suggests, when conducting your own research and writing, don't disregard a source just because it doesn't support your story and may be useful down the track. The remainder of my writing process was really a repetition of this process with regards to different aspects of the story locating sources, both primary and secondary, identifying important quotes and analysing their content where necessary and pulling it all together with words. When you write, you may adopt a similar process or perhaps you will opt for something different. I want to be honest with you. I did not set out to write a blog when I initially commenced my research. As such, my writing approach was not conscious nor direct. What I started with was two paragraphs of research that I had jotted down to take along to an exhibition team meeting. On the day of the meeting, I accidentally left a copy of my research in the reading room, untitled and unnamed. One of my colleagues found my words and returned them to another archivist, believing that they were the author. After a brief period of confusion, my research found its way back into my hands and it was suggested that since my notes were comprehensive, and um, interesting that I should turn my writing into a blog. With this new focus, I returned to my research and developed a story, turning dot points into sentences and sentences into paragraphs. When you're writing your story, you can choose how you would like to phrase your ideas. In contrast to my colleague's analytical approach, I was inspired by my experience in music production and theatre to use a creative mindset. For storytelling, it was my intention to create a comforting and engaging atmosphere. As if you were almost receiving the latest goss with your bestie over a cup of coffee or around a campfire sharing tales. I looked for opportunities to personify places as well as utilising words that could evoke passion. In the case of this sentence, I chose words such as stands, picturesque and home. Eventually, what had started out as a 600-word intro had grown in no time to 3,000 words and counting. And while this might seem like a considerable effort for a novel or perhaps a journal, my work had grown too big for one single quick blog. The length of your story depends on the type of story you write and your target audience. Like determining the genre of your story, think about who you want to read it and how they will use it before deciding on an estimated word count. While a children's picture book may have between 400 and 800 words, a novel may offer up to or beyond 60,000 words. It can be hard to restrict yourself to a certain number of words or pages when writing, but sometimes the best way to engage your audience is to refine the storyline. This can often require cutting out parts of your story. When you have so many records, it can be difficult to determine what pieces of the puzzle to add and what pieces you should omit. When you reach this stage of the creative process, we recommend reviewing your work with a critical eye, keeping only the parts which add to the overall story. Drafts are a key part of, refi of refining your story. When I write anything, whether it be an essay or report at university or this blog, I never expect to have just one draft. I had at least four drafts while writing my blog. This process allowed me to identify aspects of the story that may have been interesting standalone facts, but did not contribute significantly to the plot. 
In the introduction of my blog, I intended to provide context to the time in which the story existed. As shown on the screen, my original draft included a lot of information about the convict era and the two main systems within which convicts lived in Van Diemen's land. While this information is interesting, it was not all relevant to my story, was wordy and arguably difficult to comprehend without adding more details. As shown in my final draft, I opted for a simplified version of this by evoking a familiar image of the convict era in Tasmania and my intention to challenge this with the story of the Anson. This option provided enough context while also hooking the reader in to find out more. When it comes to writing, don't expect your first draft to be perfect. There should be space to review, edit and improve. So when you begin your writing journey, remember that your first attempt should not be the final version of it. As I was writing my blog, there were several storylines that I could have pursued, but I decided not to include in my final draft. One of the stories that did not make the cut was the death of Peter Bullman's brother, James Bullman. On the 28th of November, 1873, a party including James Bullman and his wife, Mrs. Bullman were returning from their lodgings after visiting George Fry's residence. On the road home, the wheel of their dog cart struck a stump, causing the entire vehicle to upturn. The action sent the passengers spurling onto the side of the road. According to an article published in the Cornwall Chronicle, at first glance, James Bullman did not appear to have any life threatening injuries. He merely complained of a pain in the left side that he was confident would soon improve. However, this was not to be the case. Within moments, it is said that he rapidly deteriorated, becoming insensible. He fainted and passed away by the roadside. This sudden loss of life was unexpected and cannot be described as anything but tragic. I have no doubt that the loss of his brother would have impacted Peter Bullman's perspective of life significantly. However, I chose not to add it to my story as I felt that it did not directly impact Peter Bullman's business decisions, nor did it add to the overarching storyline that I was trying to portray. While omitting certain events can be a difficult and sometimes sad decision to make, it is important to focus on the positives. In leaving gaps in our own stories and engaging the reader with some mystery, we create opportunities for others to discover more of the story through their own research and even the chance to tell their own. This ultimately supports our aim of connecting communities with the puzzle pieces of the past. They say that a picture is worth a thousand words. <laughs> the inclusion of images and photographs provide example, context and greater dimension to your story. When you are researching and writing your story, look for images or records that add to it. They may represent a key point, a person, a period of time, or provide additional context that you cannot convey through words. While some may learn, learn from reading, others prefer auditory or visual aids. By adding a visual aid to your story, you can increase your target audience and make the story accessible to a diverse group of individuals. While photography was introduced in Tasmania in 1843 by G.B. Goodman, it was an expensive, laborious and restrictive medium. As such, there exists no photos of Mrs Bowden, the female convicts on board the Anson, or the ship itself. Because of this, rather than utilising specific images of the context in which I was writing, I had to opt for broader examples that supported my story. Using keyword searches and filtering the results by date range and format type, I found through the Tasmanian archives a sketch of the Anson of Queen's Domain, Ship plans that indicate its size and thus the size of the straw bonnet manufactory. And two drawings of women wearing bonnets from around the 1840s and 1850s that indicate at least the shape of those created by the female convicts on board the Anson. Have you ever found yourself guilty of picking up a book and just flipping through the pages to find the pictures? Whilst those here today might not admit to committing this tragedy, it is important to recognise that your target audience may in fact do this. Some may tell you to fill your book to the brim with pictures is an adequate way of combating this. I would recommend that you find a balance between your writing and how many images you wish to include.
When I was in the final stages of writing The Race to a Thousand Pounds, I began to search for images that would support the overarching story. For each blog, I envisioned a new picture or a quote for every 100 to 200 words. As my colleague Chloe mentioned, finding historic photographs of people or events can be quite an undertaking. The staggering number of unidentified photographs within our collection can make finding a picture of your ancestor a tedious task. However, with a creative mindset, you can find clever alternatives that add to your writing. Let us take a glance at some of the images found within the Race to a Thousand Pound blog series. You can use maps to provide context of where someone lived and arrival or marriage records to portray key events. Include a newspaper or an article clipping or locate art that depicts a building or a landscape. Sometimes finding images that support your story can be daunting. However, we are quite fortunate that there are a range of resources available at the tip of your fingertips. Through the collections with the Tasmanian Archives, the Allport and Library and Museum of Fine Arts and the Tasmanian Names Index. If you would like to use one of the images or records within our collection, you can seek permission through a web page. Here, one of our friendly archivists or librarians will check who holds the copyright for each item, as well as any other citation conditions that you might need to include in your publication. By citing your information correctly, whether it is an image or information, you allow others to find them and explore the collections that they belong to. Images are a key aspect of historic storytelling as they can open the reader's mind to the possibilities of the past. Through stories, we can learn about the past. History can teach us about the present, help us understand why things are the way they are, and can help us make choices about the future. There are so many things that can motivate you to tell a story. Perhaps you aim to shed light on a political issue or give a voice to those throughout history who have been silenced. You might even want to capture your own family history so it can be passed down from generation to generation. Whatever draws you to storytelling, please remember that there are no right or wrong answers as to what inspires you. Over time, I have learnt the importance of recognising and telling the stories of the historically voiceless, whether that be on the grounds of race, gender, sexuality or social status. I have discover, discovered that while these people could not tell their own stories, we have the opportunity in the present to give them a platform. This has been my approach to storytelling on several occasions. Based on my own lived experience, I have sought to tell the stories of women that have been neglected within history books or classes. I did this when I was an undergraduate and postgraduate student and am fortunate to have been given the opportunity to continue doing so here at the State Library in the form of my blog. For context, women's histories have often been neglected. This has generally been based upon the assumption that women were not active participants in history, but were rather secondary citizens to men. As journalist Sue Williams said, in the past, women struggled to achieve positions of power outside the home, and even when they did make their mark on society, it was rare, rarely recorded. As was my intention with Mrs Bowden, I wanted to put a woman back into the history that had brushed over her achievements. While many scholars have focused on the failure of the probation period and the Anson as a probation station when discussing Mrs Bowden, they do not consider the obstacles she would have faced in the development of her manufacturing endeavours to achieve reformation, let alone the obstacles of being a woman at this time. Before discovering Mrs Bowden, I had not heard of a sole female superintendent during this time in Tasmanian history. There were matrons, yes, but a woman holding position that signified power and control seemed unfathomable. From my point of view, this story had to be told in some capacity. Is it, a, it is essential to tell stories such as this and to recognise the roles women and other minority or overlooked groups played in history, as we cannot fully understand the past without considering the experiences of all the players within it. When I reflect on my writing journey with the Race to a Thousand 
pounds blog series. I would not be honest with myself if I did not admit that it was the low key drama that initially attracted me to this part of history. However, as my story continued to unfold, I found that I had developed a deep sense of respect and empathy for the people within my story. At first look, their primary focus revolves around securing the £1,000 incentive. However, on closer inspection, we can see a strong connection to their community that evolves around them. Community is something that I deeply value. Over the past decade, I have been honoured to meet a diverse group of individually, individuals through my volunteer roles. I have met people who are committed to positively impacting those around them, in turn strengthening their communities and helping build a better world. I see this enthusiasm and drive echoed in the actions of Joseph James Overall, David Gledhill, Peter Bullman, and the Hoggraff and Johnson families, which in turn inspires me to tell their story. As authors and researchers, we must continue to write about the past to memorialise those who did not have the opportunity to tell their own stories. For as long as I can remember, I have been told stories, whether it was tucked up in bed, performing in a theatre, or gathered around a campfire. When I reflect on these treasured moments, it is not necessarily the content or the message behind the words that have captured my attention, but rather the passion of the storyteller. We encourage you to share your passion through stories that inspire you. As our blogs highlight, every story is different, whether that be in its subject matter, subject matter or the way it is told. No matter what story you choose to tell, if you look at a single person on a single day or chronicle the lives of many people across generations, it belongs to a bigger puzzle of events and people that came before and after it. In concluding, we would like to thank you all for coming to our talk today. We hope that it has encouraged you to think about your ancestors and the way the many stories you can tell about their lives. We'd also like to take this opportunity to thank Sandra for inviting us to speak to you here today, <laughs> our colleagues who have supported us, and our exhibition team leader, Dr Ali Marchant, who enabled us to share these stories with you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>